the topic of discussion for today is on herpes viruses in virology which is a very important and a vast topic so here we shall be discussing about that is the contents they are about introduction to herpes viruses and their morphology and the different types of viruses and these uh, different types of viruses they are dealt in relation to pathogenesis clinical features and the laboratory diagnosis in detail so now let's move into introduction so usually herpes viruses they are a large group of viruses which contain over a hundred species and these herpes viruses they are DNA viruses and uh, the main characteristic feature of these herpes viruses is that their ability to cause latent infections that means they find they initially they cause primary infections and up and later on the virus they travel to the sensory nerves and they relay in ganglia in latent state upon further uh, provocation by some stimuli the recurrent infections will happen upon periodic reactivation so there will be primary infection latency stage and the recurrent infections are seen and if you see these uh, herpes viruses uh, for them the primary hosts are humans so that is why these viruses are termed as human herpes viruses hhv and these human herpes viruses they are divided into three subfamilies based on biological physical and genetic properties the first of it is alpha herpes viridae which have relatively short replicative cycle and the latent infection will be in the sensory ganglion and it contains three different group of viruses that is hhv1 which is also called as human herpes simplex virus 1 hhv2 which is hsv2 and then uh, hhv3 which is called as varicella zoster virus and next group is beta herpes viridae where they also replicate slowly but the latent infection is seen in salivary glands and other organs and the main important viruses that belong to beta are hhv5 which is also called as cytomegalus virus and then hhv6 and hhv7 and the last group is gamma herpes viridae which has hhv4 and hhv8 wherein hhv4 it is also termed as epstein barr virus and hhv8 it is called as kaposi sarcoma herpes viridae so all together eight different hhv that is human herpes viruses are there which are grouped under three main categories now let's see the morphology of these herpes viruses this is the main uh, overall structure of herpes virus wherein initially the nuclear capsule which is present in the center is icosahedral in shape and this nuclear capsule it encloses the core which contains the double stranded dna that is which is linear double stranded dna and this nuclear capsule it is surrounded by a lipid envelope and if we see this lipid envelope there are some spikes which are seen pro, uh, projecting or jetting out from it which are called as envelope proteins or uh, spikes which are about 8 nanometers long and between this envelope and the nuclear capsid there is an amorphous structure called as tegument which contains several proteins so these are various parts of uh, herpes virus now let's move into each and every uh, herpes virus so first of it is herpes simplex virus wherein it is of two types herpes simplex virus type 1 and herpes simplex virus type 2 so here the herpes simplex virus type 1 causes uh, different types of lesions and type 2 causes different other types of lesions so hsp type 1 lesions are above the waist lesions that is uh, like oral and ocular lesions are seen in hsp type 1 whereas hsp type 2 below the waist lesions commonly genital infections ca are caused by hsp 2 and what is the pathogenesis behind her her herpes simplex virus so this pathogenesis is mainly seen in three stages and this was already discussed before that is first there will be primary infection followed by latency and then there will be recurrent infection upon provo provo uh, provoking stimuli 
so here mainly the primary infection it is commonly seen in younger age group and uh, the transfer from one person to other it is by direct contact or through secretions and this uh, herpes simplex virus initially it uh, affects the epithelium of skin oral mucous membranes or eyes resulting in vesicle formation from here the virus it travels along the sensory nerves which are uh, which supply these areas these epithelial cells so they travel along the sensory nerves and they remain latent in the ganglion supplied to the sensory nerve and for hsv type 1 it is trigeminal ganglion and for hsv type 2 it is sacral ganglion upon further provocating stimuli the latent uh, virus which is present in the ganglion they travel back through the sensory nerves resulting in recurrent infections so this is about pathogenesis of herpes simplex virus so what are all the various lesions or uh, caused by herpes simplex virus that is clinical features so first of it is cutaneous infections that is skin infections so these cutaneous infections they are manifested in the form of fever blisters which are also called as herpes fibrillis they are most commonly seen on cheeks chin in and around the mouth as well as on the forehead as you can see in the picture that lesion which is near the uh, corner of the mouth they are fever blisters and next uh, condition is eczema herpeticum wherein it is a generalized herpetic eruption which is also seen in children so as you can see in this picture it is generalized herpetic eruptions next is mucosal lesions wherein uh, the buccal mucosa or the labial mucosa is the most commonly affected site and you can see this picture where there are herpetic ulcers which are seen on the labial mucosa along with these there can be gingivus stomatitis and pharyngitis that are seen as primary infections but uh, there can be recurrent infections also wherein uh, the herpetic uh, vesicles they are seen on the lips that is called as herpes labialis and here the vesicles they may ulcerate and sometimes they can also become secondarily infected this is a picture of herpes labialis next is ophthalmic lesions wherein eyes are also affected resulting in acute keratoconjunctivitis and follicular conjunctivitis with vesicle formation and uh, now this is a picture of uh, eyes uh, ophthalmic lesions that are seen in uh, herpetic simple herpes simplex virus infection wherein resulting in keratitis next is visceral lesions wherein hsv esophagitis is seen tracheobronchitis and pneumonitis and sometimes erythema multiforme can also be caused because of herpes simplex virus uh, next clinical feature it can be genital lesions or also can be seen like in case of males urethritis is seen whereas in case of females infections of cervix vagina vulva and perineum can be involved so these are the various clinical features of uh, herpes simplex virus next we shall move into laboratory diagnosis of herpes simplex virus infections so whenever we see any of the above mentioned clinical features to detect that it is a hsv infection we need to perform some investigations so to perform that investigations first of all we need to collect the specimens from the affected area okay like in case of vesicle fluid or skin swabs or saliva or csf or brain biopsy or something okay the first investigation which can be done is direct examination or microscopy wherein it can be done by zang smear which is a rapid technique wherein the smears they are prepared from the lesions the, mainly from the base of the vesicles and these smears which are taken they are stained with 1% solution of toluidine blue and observed under the microscope when you observe it under the microscope you can see numerous multinucleated germ cells as you can see in this picture and sometimes these cells they contain facetted nuclei and ground glass chromatin and these cells are called as zang cells and uh, sometimes these smears they can be stained with germs or stain also upon germs or stain we can even observe some inclusion bodies within these cells and these inclusion bodies are called as cowdery type a inclusion bodies and this is on light microscopy but if we observe under electron microscopy we can directly see the virus particle itself so this is about direct examination uh, uh, again um, there is also fluorescent antibody technique also which uh, can be done on brain biopsy specimens to check for encephalitis 
so this fluorescent antibody test it is a very reliable as well as a good diagnostic technique to uh, rule out encephalitis so this is about direct examination or microscopy next is virus isolations or tissue culture wherein virus it will uh, grow uh, like uh, it uh, infests on live uh, matter so uh, the culture we, medium will be human embryonic kidney human amnion or human diploid fibroblasts which are commonly preferred to grow so upon growth then we should observe for cytopathic effects like um, ballooning degeneration or uh, multinucleated gene cells or syncytial formation so if we see these cytopathic effects then we can confirm that it is herpes simplex virus so this is about tissue culture of virus isolation the next investigation which can be done is serology a serology wherein the serum the blood is uh, taken to observe for antibodies that is as the virus is an antigen when it enters the body our body produces antibodies which are specific for that virus so this virus specific antibodies can be uh, detected by ELISA that is enzyme linked immunosorbent assay neutralization test or complement fixation test the next uh, investigation is polymerase chain reaction wherein uh, virus specific DNA as polymerase chain reaction detects nucleic acids so the HSV specific DNA can be detected using PCR as the PCR is a sensitive test uh, yeah, this will be more reliable also so this is in detail about herpes simplex virus next we will move on to the next group of uh, herpes virus that is varicella zoster virus so here uh, like in case of uh, human, uh, herpes simplex virus there is a primary infection which results in chicken pox or varicella and the uh, recurrent infection uh, can uh, recurrent infection it is termed as herpes zoster this is the reason why the virus is named as varicella zoster virus and what is the pathogenesis behind both the chicken pox and herpes zoster Firstly, we shall talk about chicken box, which is also called varicella, wherein the main portal of entry of virus is through respiratory tract or conjunctiva. So, as you can see in the picture, the virus is entering through the respiratory tract or conjunctiva into the body, resulting in other lesions. And here, after entry, the incubation period is about 7 to 23 days, after which the lesions will begin to appear and the lesions will be in the form of rashes which appear mainly on the trunk in a centripetal distribution that means it mainly affects the trunk sparing the distal parts of the limbs and these rashes they evolve from multiple stages that is first one is a macute which is a flat pigmented stage or a papule or vesicle where are fluid filled blisters or a pustule which is filled with the pus and then scab formation so if you see in this picture the mainly the rashes or the lesions they are on the trunk region in multiple stages some are in pustule stage some are in papule and vesicle stage okay usually this varicella or chickenpox they are seen in children but if at all it occurs in adults it will be more severe compared to that of the children and once uh, an attack of chickenpox occurs it will provide a lifelong immunity to the person and this varicella it may cross the placenta uh, placenta and uh, it might infect the fetus so this transmission from mother to fetus might result in congenital malformations also and once chickenpox is uh, attacked there can be multiple complications that can be seen after that uh, the main complications are pneumonia and viral encephalitis which can occur so this is about chicken pox next we shall see about herpes zoster like I already told you herpes zoster is a recurrent infection of varicella zoster virus that is after primary infection the virus goes and lay, lay, goes into latency and stays in sensory ganglion once the immunity of the person is lowered or any provocating stimuli are seen then reactivation of the virus will happen wherein the virus travels along the sensory nerve and uh, goes to the area supplied by the nerves that is a single sensory through the single sensory ganglion and they result in unilateral lesions that means the lesions are seen only on one side of the face they doesn't cross the midline so the most commonly affected nerve 
in herpes zoster is trigeminal nerve so where the three branches of trigeminal nerve the maxillary mandibular and ophthalmic branches are affected so if you see in this picture lesions are seen only on one side of the face and they are not crossing the midline towards the other side that is they are uh, the lesions are seen only on the only in the areas which are supplied by the nerve that's all so this is about herpes zoster and uh, there is a separate condition uh, that is associated with herpes zoster that is ramsey hunt syndrome wherein it is a zoster infection of the facial nerve which causes rash which results in rashes that are seen on tympanic membrane and external auditory canal and sometimes also resulting in facial palsy so it is a zoster infection of facial nerve wherein ear in uh, ear rashes on the ear area as well as facial palsy are seen next is laboratory diagnosis wherein usually this uh, virus ella zoster virus infections they are cl they are detected by clinical examination only if at all like if we need to do any further investigations firstly it is direct microscopy which is very much similar to that of hsv infections that is upon um, tolid in blue exam uh, smear examination we will see multinucleated gene cells and a cowdery type a intranuclear inclusions and we can even do gene sa stain smear also and then further we can what we can do is vi virus isolation so here the virus isolation usually they are attempted uh, on the buccal or cutaneous lesions in the early stages of the lesion by inoculating them on human amnion human fibroblast hlr vero cells and after inoculation in these uh, various any of these culture media we will observe for the cytopathic effects that are caused by the virus like ballooning cells or sensation formation the next investigation is serology that is blood examination for virus specific antibodies so here the virus is varicella zoster virus specific antibodies that are detected through various tests like enzyme linked immunosorbent assay that is elisa neutralization test pcr immunofluorescence and complement fixation test so these are done to detect the virus specific antibodies this is about varicella zoster virus next we shall move into cytomegalovirus which is an another type of human herpes virus so this cytomegalovirus it is also called as salivary gland virus that is previously and the main the feature main feature of cytomegalovirus is that it is the largest virus in the herpes family and they are also grown on human diploid fibroblast cultures like the other viruses human diploid fibroblast cultures so what is the pathogenesis behind cytomegalovirus infections so these cytomegaloviruses they can be transmitted transplacentally from a mother with a latent infection to the fetus so a mother with latent infection can trans tran, uh, transmit the virus to the fetus so wherein it can cause congenital infection sometimes it they will be asymptomatic at birth but uh, later on they might lead to a disease called as cytomegalic inclusion disease which is uh, fatal in nature and the main features of this cytomegalo cytomegalic inclusion disease are hepatosplenomegaly jaundice thrombocytopenic purpura microcephaly and chorioretinitis so these are the features of cytomegalic inclusion disease other than uh, going into congenital infection sometimes they might also cause postnatal infections wherein the transmission is through that is the way they are acquired is through sexual intercourse blood transfusion and organ transplantation so here the clinical disease that can be seen in these postnatal infections are in the form of hepatitis pneumonitis or sometimes even the disease might uh, uh, resemble infectious mononucleosis also so this is the pathogenesis of cytomegalovirus infections next is laboratory diagnosis or laboratory investigations that are done for cmv infections firstly specimen collection wherein cmv virus it can be collected depending upon the uh, symptom that is from uh, urine 
saliva, breast milk, semen, cervical secretions and blood. So next is direct examination wherein uh, demonstration of cytomegalic cells can be done. Cytomegalic that means enlarged or big cells. Okay, so these enlarged or big cells they contain uh, intranuclear inclusions which are in the form of owl's eye shape. So these enlarged cells they show intranuclear inclusions which are owl's eye inclusions. So if you see this picture that is a very large cell that is an enlarged cell with owl eye inclusions. So this is on microscopy and sometimes we can even isolate the virus that is virus isolation like I told you before here the virus is grown on human fibroblast cells and observed for cytopathic effects. And then we can even do polymerase chain reaction to detect the nucleic acid of the specific virus. So CMV specific DNA can be detected by polymerase chain reaction. And then serology or blood examination which are done to detect the antibodies against the cytomegalovirus that is CMV specific IgM antibodies that are detected by ELISA technique. So this is about cytomegalovirus. And then we will move on to the next group of herpes viruses that is Epstein-Barr virus which is very big as well as important topic. Where in this Epstein-Barr virus, it is named after the discoverers Epstein and Barr along with uh, Achang, uh, uh, in 1964 they discovered this virus and these Epstein-Barr virus, it has a high affinity to lymphoid tissue wherein B lymphocytes are affected by this virus. How these B lymphocytes are affected by Epstein-Barr virus is through CD21 receptors so these CD21 receptors are present on B lymphocytes which attract the which are uh, wherein these Epstein-Barr virus gets attracted to these receptors. So what they does to these B lymphocytes is they cause proliferation of these cells that is excessive proliferation and sometimes they will be good in nature and bad in nature that is normal B lymphocytes can be there or clonal uh, malignant lymphocytes also can be there. So what is the pathogenesis behind this? So this virus first of all it can be transmitted through saliva, oral contact or through kissing wherein the virus uh, travels, uh, virus enters these pharyngeal epithelial cells and infect them. So how does they enter into these pharyngeal epithelial cells is that is through again the same CD21 receptors wherein the virus multiplies locally and then they enter the bloodstream or lymph node and then they infect the B lymphocytes. So these B lymphocytes in which the virus they remain latent sometimes and they transform these lymphocytes. So the transformation will be in the form of like immortalizing these cells that is immortalized cells or transformed cells. That means these cells they will be capable of indefinite growth that is why immortalized cells. And as a property of B lymphocytes they cause uh, they uh, produce immunoglobulins. So there are different types of immunoglobulins that are produced here and uh, sometimes uh, because of uh, immortalization of these B lymphocytes in that process there will be blast transformation that is seen in T lymphocytes resulting in abnormal or atypical lymphocytes. This presence of atypical lymphocytes is a feature of infectious mononucleosis which is a condition that is a feature of Epstein-Barr virus infection. And sometimes these B lymphocytes they undergo clonal proliferation resulting in various malignancies. So seeing the pathogens we shall move on to the clinical features now. So as I already told you infectious mononucleosis which is, an, uh, which is a feature of Epstein-Barr virus infection which is also called as glandular fever or kissing disease. So usually this is a self-limiting disease that is commonly seen in young children, uh, younger adults and children wherein it is characterized by fever, sore throat that is pharyngitis as you can see in the picture and uh, swollen lymph nodes or lymphadenopathy and subclinical hepatitis or uh, hepatosplenomegaly and upon peripheral blood we can see abnormal or atypical lymphocytes. 
next are ebv associated malignancies the main important of these malignancies is burkitt's lymphoma wherein it is a malignant neoplasm of b lymphocytes and this burkitt's lymphoma most commonly affects the jaws that is maxilla and mandible and it is of two types that is endemic form or a sporadic form endemic form is in where usually uh, P, uh, uh, that is african uh, it is uh, most commonly seen in africans that is why this burkitt's lymphoma is also called as african jaw lymphoma and the next type of malignancy is nasopharyngeal carcinoma wherein as i already told you pharyngeal epithelial cells are affected here so those epithelial cells they undergo malignant transformation resulting in nasopharyngeal carcinoma and they are commonly seen in male patients and the next malignancy that is seen is b cell lymphoma wherein it is seen in organ transplant patients or hiv infected patients wherein ebv associated b cell lymphoma is very common and what is the laboratory diagnosis or laboratory investigations that are performed in ebv virus infections first and important test is paul bunnell test which is commonly done in infectious mononucleosis patients so in the serum of infectious mononucleosis patient so here what happens is uh, these are heterophil antibodies that are detected these heterophil antibodies are nothing but they are igm antibodies which are elicited by ebv virus in the acute stages of the infection so what does these antibodies do is they agglutinate sheep erythrocytes or sheep rbcs so using this phenomenon this test is done wherein inactivated serum of the patient is taken inactivated serum in the sense serum is heated to 56 degree centigrade for 30 minutes and will make it inactivated and then we will take it in multiple tubes in doubling dilutions and then it is mixed with equal volumes of 1% sheep erythrocyte suspension so it is mixed with equal volumes of 1% sheep rbc suspension and now these uh, tubes they are incubated at 37 degree centigrade for 4 hours after incubation we have to observe for agglutination so like uh, what does it, as there are multiple uh, doubling dilution multiple dilution uh, tubes are there so we shall see for a titer of 100 or above wherein it suggests uh, the patient is suffering from infectious mononucleosis so the titer of 100 or above suggests infectious mononucleosis so other than paul bunnell test we can uh, look for wbc count wherein initial stages they show leukopenia that is decrease in wbcs and in later stages it, there will be leukocytosis why because there will be abnormal proliferation of atypical lymphocytes and these atypical lymphocytes is in the form of lymphoblast stage so leukocytosis is seen in later stages the next uh, investigation is ebv specific antibodies can be observed wherein igm antibody uh it is seen in initial or primary infections whereas igg antibodies they persist throughout the life and is an indication of past or late infections and there are other antibodies that is uh, antibody to eb nuclear antigen epstein barr nuclear antigen which is also called as ebna so if at all this antibody is seen then it is it uh, tells that it is a good indicator or a reliable marker for primary infection so this is about epstein barr virus and this is in detail about herpes viruses and uh, now that this topic is very important in exam point of view so it might come as an essay or individual group of viruses they can come as short note and sometime individual lab laboratory diagnosis also can be asked as a short note so try to concentrate on each and every part of this herpes virus so at least in exam point of view